Well, hello and good evening. Uh, my name is Dan Plesch, and for the last uh, decade now, I've had the great pleasure to be director of the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy here at SOAS. And I'm pleased to say we now have some six different postgraduate programmes, and some of which you can study online without ever coming to London. Uh, I, there are leaflets, uh, so uh, I will spare you any further uh, direct publicity for the centre. But one of the great treats over the years has been this annual law lecture, which I uh, inherited from my predecessor, Dr. Slynn of the, the Law School, um, and which is organised by civil society incarnate. Some of us study civil society. Um, David Wardrop, the, the gentleman in the middle here on the platform, is civil society, and I'll say a word or two about him in a moment. Um, uh, this event, uh, which is very much his uh, inspiration and creation, brings together uh, not just uh, SOAS and uh, uh, the Bar Council and the Westminster branch of the United Nations Association, but within SOAS, both um, the CISD and, and the Law School. Um, so in that sense, it's a, a multi-agency operation, and for that coordination alone, David should be, should be thanked. And we've had a, a distinguished uh, uh, gallery of speakers over the decade or so that I've been in post. I'm not going to talk about our speakers and the running order. That's, that's David's job. It's my job to embarrass David. <laughs> um, uh, and I'll set out to do it. Um, there was a 60th anniversary of the United Nations in uh, 2005, uh, or thereabouts, if I have it right. Um, and the United Nations Association, the government, the UN, UN itself, wasn't much interested in a 60th anniversary. David had other ideas. <laughs> he booked St. Paul's. <laughs> he invited Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Her Majesty accepted. St. Paul's was filled. The anniversary was marked. Thanks to David. <laughs> David and his team in Westminster UNA, all of whom are volunteers, and operate alongside um, the main uh, UNA in Whitehall, organize uh, film shows, study trips, uh, cooperation with organizations uh, in uh, Egypt. Uh, I lose track. Um, all of this comes out of voluntary energy. And you may think that uh, David, as an august uh, individual as such as this, is uh, perhaps just short of being a peer of the realm and a retiree of um, uh, the Foreign Service, uh, not a bit of it, uh, in the finest traditions of British civil society, David Wardrop is a retired used car salesman. <laughs> <laughs> so, as we study civil society at SOAS and have all of our preconceptions about the sort of people who support civil society and are interested, and when we discuss and are told about the Westminster village and the chattering classes. Just remember what is achieved by a retired used car salesman when all these stereotypes are fed to us. So uh, hopefully his ears are burning and his cheeks are red. Um, it's now my great pleasure to hand over to David who will introduce our speakers and the running order. I'm sure given his background, he won't forget, but I will say if you stay the course through to the vote of thanks, there is a wine reception outside afterwards, which is perhaps the second most important thing to say to you this <laughs> evening. Without any more, David Waterup. So I come to the most important part of tonight's activities. It is to plug Dan's new book. <laughs> I must admit, um, and having known Dan for a long time, in the early days before the internet, before um, so much information became on, online, he was the person worldwide who discovered the early days of the United Nations, those early years in the late 40s, early 40s, and what happened. Um, it was, his work was 
a labor of love and, and very few of us believed he would actually conquer it. But as so much more information became online, I guess it became easier. And his three or four books, now the latest one, Human Rights After Hitler, I think his titles have always been fantastic, um, is going to hit the shelves in a month's time. Uh, I congratulate you, Dan, on, on behalf of so many people who are in the United Nations and work for what the United Nations tries to do. You have made sense out of what many of us had seen was the fog of its earliest years. Congratulations. Um, it was 14 years ago when we, in, my colleagues and I, who are many of here, had to decide how we would remember a most remarkable woman, Ruth Steinkraus Cohen, after whom this lecture is named, and who, whose forceful personality had led to, amongst other things, the real formation of the United Nations Association in the United States, and twinned her Connecticut chapter with our branch in Westminster. Uh, we benefited in her legacy. How should we remember her? The year 2003, the answer lay all around us. Today is March the 7th. A couple of weeks ago, 14 years ago, 8 million people had marched against the impending war in Iraq, the most in history. It seemed that the United Nations was being brushed aside by nations deciding not to go to the Security Council and test the validity of their case. And that is what happened. Ruth had two driving forces in her life. One was the United Nations, and the second was the work of Hugo Grotius, the father of international law. And that was obvious for us. But still, how could we raise the awareness of what the United Nations was there for and what it could do now with troops in Iraq? So he called the UN Legal Counsel, Hans Carell, in New York, and said there's one place in this country, which is doubting the future of the United Nations, which is the UN. That's the International Maritime Organization in the South Bank. And said, you come over here and tell the British people exactly the role of the United Nations. And that was the inaugura inaugural lecture, and now we're 14 years later. We've been very lucky. Right from the start, the Bar Council supported us in that very first year at the International Maritime Organization. And I'm so pleased that the chairman of the bar, the chairman of the International Committee and colleagues are with us here, loyally supporting our annual event. Thank you very much. Before I introduce our speaker, and I'm not going to dwell too much on her background because all of you who have registered chose to attend because you saw the important role she plays. But last year, I was foolish enough, foolish enough to say that this annual law lecture was one of three flagship events we hold in the year. The, the second is to mark the International Day of United Nations Peacekeepers. Thousands of peacekeepers have died around the world. They come from 120 countries. But not one of the 194 countries in the world actually marks the death of peacekeepers on UN Peacekeepers Day, the 29th of May. I think that's remarkable. So 13 years ago, we started our conference and a ceremony at the Cenotaph, initially with traffic passing either side, but now all that Whitehall is blocked off for us. And this last year, we had 100 embassies laying wreaths, marking dead peacekeepers from other people's countries. That's the remarkable thing. But I have to say the more remarkable thing is not a single government in the world does that. It's deplorable. The third thing we do is our film festival, which this last year had screenings in 14 countries. I will we'll just see a promo of next year's um, program. And all of you who are registered will have information about our film festival. 
because they've got a, an incredibly important message. Uh, it's been uh, well uh, constructed, um, well planned and organised. Uh, so a lovely evening, um, very informative and educational for me. This is a great platform where we can talk about what's happening in countries such as Congo, Syria, and also to discuss about a solution. What are we actually doing in order to, uh, to play a part? So yeah, it's really, really important. So, as I say, each of you who have registered um, will know all about the film festival when it happens in November. Now I have the great pleasure of introducing our speaker tonight, Francoise Hampson. I've known Francoise for a long time. She spoke, has spoken at uh, our meetings in, in Parliament several times, and I'm struck by the clarity with which she... Okay. Um, with, with, with she handles... Uh, the issues in which she's spoken about. And um, is one, she's one of the few speakers. When I make reports of what she has written, I go back to the hyperlinks and make sure that everyone knows exactly the source of her information. Um, she's a remarkable speaker. I won't say anything more about Francoise because each of you who have read her CV on the Eventbrite documents. Francoise, welcome to the podium. I should like to thank Dan, David, and the UNA, SOAS, and the Bar Council for the honor of asking me to deliver the Ruth Steincross Cohen lecture. I think you've already seen that everything Dan said about David was completely correct. If the rest of the UNA throughout the world was as active as the Westminster branch, I think we'd be living in a very different world. I suspect that the subject of today's discussion would have been of great interest to Ruth Steincross Cohen, even though she might not have been all that pleased about the actual content. My topic is, is international law in crisis? That's not principally about the content of international law. It's about international law as a legal system and about the role it plays. It's important to remember that international law is law, but that it does not function in the way that domestic law functions. In particular, litigation plays a less significant role than at the national level. This means that governments acting in the name of states are expected to behave in conformity with international law. They're not expected to push their luck, as it were, with the courts left to determine whether they can get away with it. I think the evidence given by Jack Straw to the Chilcot inquiry suggests that he did not understand the nature of international law, and indeed that was Elizabeth Wilmshurst's comment on his evidence. So with this title, I am expected to cover, I've chosen to cover, 70 years worth of international law, I'm not going back to Hugo Grotius, in about 30 minutes, which is one reason why you're not getting PowerPoints, because I think that would just distract. So, is international law in crisis implies, I think, some kind of change. It's suggesting that international law used to have one role or used to have some characteristics and now has different ones. It also implies that any change there is, is not for the better. And it's those two elements that I would like to consider this evening. Limitations of time mean that I'm going to have to proceed by way of sweeping generalizations. And this, of course, is somewhat uncomfortable for a lawyer in that I won't have time for qualifying phrases or caveats, which may be refreshing for all the non-lawyers. I shall look briefly at international law at five periods. 1945, 1975, 1990, 
2000 and now. And all being well, this will enable us to get some idea of whether there's been a change in the direction of travel of international law with regard to various elements in it. First, the form of international agreements, has that changed? The implementation and the respect of such commitments. And also whether there's been a change in the general sense of commitment to the rule of law between states, the lawness of international law. So starting with 1945, and I recognize here that I'm being ahistorical, those who were practicing in 1945 would naturally have looked back to possibly uh, before, um, 1913, 1918, 1939. They wouldn't have seen themselves as the start of a process. I readily admit I'm looking back <coughs> from now, so I've got all the instincts of someone looking at it from 2017, and that means that I, the things that I highlight might have come as a bit of a surprise to those practicing at that time. But I think it's legitimate when looking at the evolution to cast 2017 eyes on 1945. So as compared to today, for a start, there were very few states. Much of the world was still painted a variety of colonial colors, in the case of the United Kingdom, pink. There were also, as compared to today, limited areas of activity in need of regulation. We tend to forget the change there has been in the areas subject to regulation in the past 70 years. International trade law and international environmental law, for example, barely existed there were only a very limited number of regional or international intergovernmental institutions, whereas now there's a plethora of them. Customary law still played a really important role, which was much easier when there was only a limited number of states making it, and the rate of change, at least as seen from here, was very gradual. There were both bilateral and multilateral treaties, but the key hallmark of such treaties was that they depended on reciprocity. The norms in the treaties were not seen as giving rise to absolute standards or a bottom line. If another party broke the rules, the victim of the breach was entitled to regard the treaty as suspended. So that means even though you've agreed to do one thing, if one side breaks the rules, you act as if the treaty wasn't there. I have the impression that most, if not all states, regarded compliance with international law as something to be taken seriously. But strong national interests might be seen as in some sense, justifying a breach of the rules, but obviously not in the eyes of the law itself. But as far as states were concerned, if the national interest was sufficiently important, then yes, even though it breached international law, you'd do the thing in question. I suspect that even in 1945, there was a difference between European states and the United States in how seriously international law requirements were to be treated, and therefore how important the countervailing national interests had to be to justify a breach. I think you needed more national interest in the case of European states than I suspect was the case in the US. But in terms of how they spoke about international law, I think, broadly speaking, European states and the US took a similar position. Turning to 1975. Between 1945 and 1975, so a 30-year period, a range of developments took place. Some had an immediate impact, but others were more in the nature of a slow-acting fuse. In other words, the change happened between 45 and 75, but the significance of the change emerged later. The first thing to note is that by 1975, most colonies had gained their independence. In other words, there were far more states than there had been in 1945, which of course is going to have implications for the making of international law. Furthermore, there's a much greater diversity amongst these states at least in relation to things like development, than was the case in 45. So it's not just there's more of them, but they're much more varied than they had been. 
In this 30-year period, a very considerable number of regional and international intergovernmental organizations have been created. So there's a lot of people doing stuff that hadn't previously been doing it. Some of these organizations had dispute settlement mechanisms. That meant there was the possibility of authoritative determination of violation. So it was no longer just left to the states themselves to say, oh, I think you violated the rules, or very occasionally the International Court of Justice. In this 30-year period, new areas of international law had emerged or were beginning to emerge. The General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, which was the forerunner of the World Trade Organization, was in a position to promote international trade law. Most obviously, between 1945 and 1975, we saw the emergence of international human rights law. Even though what international human rights law was about was traditionally the antithesis of international law. It was about what states did in their territory. That, historically, had been excluded from international law because it was purely domestic law. So it's not just that this is a new area, but it's a new kind of area. 1945 saw the creation of the first of what became known as UN Special Procedures in the human rights field. The two UN covenants and the American Convention on Human Rights had not yet in entered into force, but were to do so the following year, in the case of the covenants, and in 1978 for the American Convention. And of course, a regional mechanism to which I will refer later existed in Europe. In the case of this human rights machinery, we have an example of the slow acting fuse. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the American Convention and the European Convention, provided for a right of individual petition. That was to come into its own fully approximately 20 years later. In this period, there were a significant number of standard-setting international agreements that were concluded. The Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties made significant changes in the treaty regime. First, it provided that in the case of a limited category of treaties, a state was not free to suspend the provisions of a treaty just because the other side had violated an obligation. In other words, there was a bottom line. That represents a significant change. Another significant departure was the approach taken in the Vienna Convention to reservations. As of 1945, a state that wanted to ratify a treaty with a reservation could only do so if every other state accepted the reservation. That meant a lot of states ended up not joining in treaties because they couldn't get universal acceptance of the reservation. In the Vienna Convention, it turned that on its head. You were free to make reservations unless they were expressly excluded or they were inconsistent with the objects and purposes. So that promoted inclusion into treaty regimes. So you can see there's a significant impact there on how treaties are going to work, which is the principal instrument in international law. In 1975, a very interesting treaty was in the process of being negotiated, and that's UNCLOS, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And the first thing to note about that is it's really rather odd that they needed to negotiate it at all. In 1958, there had been agreement on four separate treaties dealing with four separate areas of the law of the sea. But that actually turned out to be a problem because states would ratify the bits they liked or the treaties they liked and not the ones they didn't like. So you ended up with a complete patchwork of obligation and it was very difficult to see when looking at two states and the obligations they owed one another what on earth they were. They had therefore decided that this area, the law of the sea, needed to be subject to comprehensive regulation, not just something on territorial sea, something on fishes, something on exclusive economic zone. Everything needed to be dealt with together. Now, the logic of that is since you're dealing with it as a package, you can't have any reservations because in that case you'd fragment the treaty. So this UNCLOS, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, 
was negotiated as a package. They always knew it was going to be a package deal and it duly prohibited the making of reservations. So what we can see with these new areas of international law, including new kinds of areas, special treaties making significant changes in how international law works, you can see a significant degree of creativity and flexibility. The tools of international law were being adapted to suit the particular needs of different subject areas. This very adaptability was ensuring that either international law was more useful or at least that it was useful. There was no homogeneity of approach. You didn't say all treaties must be like this. All international organizations must be like that. Having said that, because this looks like good news, we need to remember that in some areas there had been virtually no progress. In 1975, the UN Security Council was in full Cold War deadlock. At a regional level, there was one development that makes all the others pale into insignificance. It was radically innovative, and that was in Europe. The EEC, and I mean the EEC, not the EU, the European Economic Community, which absorbed the European Coal and Steel Community and Euratom, was the first and to date the only supranational organization. Most intergovernmental institutions, if they come up with a decision that only binds states, it doesn't have a direct effect in the domestic legal order of states. If you want to change the domestic law of states through something that has been decided by an intergovernmental organization, it's necessary for the legislature to pass national legislation. As a result of the provisions of the Treaty of Rome and the role given to the European Court of Justice, that's not the case with regard to certain forms of decision-making, notably regulations, in the EEC. That gives rise to an interesting chicken-and-egg problem. Were European states willing to accept such a development, the creation of supranationality, because they already had a different attitude to international law? Or did the acceptance of supranationality speed up the development of what had originally only been a slight difference of attitude? I don't know the answer to that question. No. By 1975, it was fairly clear that European states had a different attitude to international law than other states. They generally recognized the sheer lawness of it that this was not simply one of the elements to be taken into account when deciding what the national policy was going to be. It actually was there as a constraining element, as law. Within Europe, some states were further advanced than others, but generally speaking, all European states were much further advanced in this direction than, say, the USA or the Soviet Union or India or any other state. The next stopping off point is 1990. In the period between 1975 and 1989, it might be argued there were few radical new developments in international law. I don't mean it had gone backwards. There was a consolidation of the kinds of things we saw between 1945 and 1975. So it's not that there were no changes, but that the changes tended to be in the same direction of travel and at the same speed of travel. Important agreements were concluded and or entered into force between 75 and 90, including more human rights treaties. The rules on the conduct of hostilities, which essentially had not been updated in treaty form since 1907, were comprehensively updated in 1977, notwithstanding the Cold War. Many topic-specific, not field-specific, even narrower than that, many topic-specific <coughs> agreements were concluded under the aegis of intergovernmental organizations. I think that raises an interesting question for possibly someone's um, master's dissertation or even a thesis. Once an organization is created, does it <coughs> tend to mean you get more law being created? Again, I don't know the answer to that. I think it would be an interesting question. But the really big change between 1975 and 1990 was a political one. 
It was a political one which had significant implications for the operation of international law. I am, of course, referring to the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Warsaw Pact and then the Soviet Union. First, newly independent states queued up to ratify an incredible number of international treaties that they had not previously ratified. They did so without reservation, and I must confess that I've often wondered whether they did so without reading them. They seem to want, these Eastern European states and some of the stands, seem to want to subscribe to the rule of law at the international level, even if they weren't very sure what it meant. They thought that by ratifying treaties, you were joining the club. You were showing that you were responsible. The previous doctrinaire rejection of custom as a source of international law as part of Marxist doctrine disappeared. But above all, the political change removed the deadlock in the Security Council. So as far as the evolution of international law is concerned, some interesting things of a similar type to what had happened before occurred. But a change happened at the end of this period that might lead to something dramatically different afterwards. And at this point, I turn to 2000. So as of 2000, you're looking back on a 10-year period, 1990 to 2000. As we entered the new millennium, we could look back on a quite remarkable decade for international law. First, in 1990, the Security Council acted pretty well as envisaged in the UN Charter. That must have been something that Ruth Steincross Cohen attach particular significance to. The Security Council agreed that Iraq in invading Kuwait had committed an act of aggression. It imposed universally applicable and universally applied sanctions. Even Switzerland went along with the sanctions and at the time it wasn't a member of the UN. They did take three days so that all the banking stuff could pass through Switzerland first but they then went along with them. A coalition under US authority was put together and expelled Iraq from Kuwait. There was no regime change. One can see why this looked like a new world order, which was the phrase used by President Bush Père. A new world order based on law. However, this did not mean the end of war, the end of crimes against humanity or genocide. Because this remarkable decade saw the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia and genocide in Rwanda. What was different was the response to these things. Those calamities were not prevented. They weren't stopped rapidly once they begun. But international criminal law, which had been on ice since the Nuremberg trials, was reborn and developed rapidly. By the end of the decade, we had the Rome Statute creating an international criminal court. I submit that we could not have had that statute that could not have happened before what I'll call the magic decade. It wouldn't have happened before and it wouldn't have happened since. But it's not the only treaty in that category. There is a lesser known treaty of which the same, exactly the same thing could be said, and that's the Chemical Weapons Convention. It's really quite difficult because of the nature of chemical weapons, controlling, uh, getting an effective system of implementation. So they knew to make this thing work, you had to have a really good system of implementation. The system in the convention is the most detailed, the most intrusive, and the most costly, in purely economic terms, of any implementation system I've ever come across. Again, I don't think we would have got it before that decade, and I don't think we'd have got it afterwards. Alongside those two pretty cosmic developments and the functioning of the Security Council, earlier initiatives came into their own, most notably the right of individual petition. Judgments were rendered, particularly by the European Court of Human Rights and the American Court of Human Rights, that had significant implications for the respondent governments. So the first thing was, the judgments were rendered, but they generally accepted them. If you want an example, think of the case of McCann, the Gibraltar killings case. 
That was a very close decision all the way through the national courts and the Commission and the European Court of Human Rights. And yet the UK accepted the finding that in the planning of the operation in Gibraltar, nothing, not enough had been done to protect the right to life. So that decade, the 1990s, also showed human rights law being used in situations of conflict. That has developed much more since then, but it was a striking feature of some of the litigation. As a member of the UN Subcommission on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights from 1998, I was really struck by what seemed to be a change in the attitude of states. And this wasn't just that I was wearing a UN hat and previously I'd worn an NGO activist hat. I was used to states refusing to engage in any meaningful sense if you attempted to raise human rights concerns with them. They seemed to assume that this was all a political ploy by the West. So you might be talking law, but you meant politics. That began to change. And I think that what made a difference was partly the end of the Cold War, but also the fact that non-European states could see European states who were beating them about the head about their human rights record were themselves accepting judgments against them. They weren't just talking the talk, they were walking the walk. When they said you're not allowed to do this, they might well themselves have already been found to have violated that. And recognizing that the language of international law was not simply a political tool, but had an autonomous way in and of itself, began to change the attitude of other states. I think that was reinforced by the fact that all these newly independent Eastern European states, enthusiastically ratifying every human rights treaty in sight, tended to reinforce the Western European position. And it was also reinforced by the political changes in Central and Latin America, where you'd got the overthrow of military regimes and the, and the installation of democratic regimes that were very concerned to transition from their previous attitude to the rule of law. So a range of things led to it, but it does seem to me that non-European states were beginning to see that international law might, simple, might not simply be one of the elements you take into account, but it was significant as law. They're not yet convinced, but they're open to the argument. I think you can see that as some states accepted, at least in some fields, intrusions into national sovereignty that I think they wouldn't previously have accepted. One example there, I think, is the ratification by so many African states of the Rome Statute. Maybe they thought that this was part of being a responsible citizen of the international community. In this period between 1990 and 2000, European states continued to take international law ever more seriously. If you said something was in breach of international law, and if they, that was not really arguable, then that was an end of a discussion, right? That meant you didn't do it. Within Europe, the gap between those in the lead and those a bit further behind narrowed. In particular, France at long last discovered international law. Um, but that's only since the late 1990s. I speak as a dual national, so I'm allowed to criticize them. I think this increasing sense of the lawness of international law went hand in hand with an ever greater reliance on multilateralism, not merely in the negotiation of treaties, but in how you set about addressing problems. You didn't attempt simply to sort them out bilaterally. And this new focus on multi multilateralism included Russia. The end of this decade between 1990 and 2000 <coughs> was marked by one negative development the intervention in Kosovo. It was generally seen as understandable, possibly morally right, but as unlawful, which is a weird combination. Nevertheless, whilst it could hardly be said that the rule of international law reigned triumphant, bearing in mind the genocide in Rwanda, 
At the end of the 1990s, international lawyers could look back on a more positive decade than any of them had known in their professional lifetimes. Compliance and respect still, still pose significant problems, but a lot of progress had been made in taking law seriously as law. Turning now to 2017. The first two shocks to the system were consequences of 9-11, but not actually 9-11 itself. At first, things carried on as normal. The Security Council accepted that the USA had been the victim of an armed attack by non-state actors, enabling it to invoke the right of self-defense in relation to Afghanistan. Note, in relation to Afghanistan. The invasion of Iraq was another matter. In the view of the overwhelming majority of states and the overwhelming majority of international lawyers, the invasion of Iraq was an act of aggression and was unlawful. It should be emphasized that the norm that was being violated, the prohibition of aggression, was seen as particularly important. I know that all law is law and all law is equal, but in terms of criminal law, by analogy, it's as if you were talking about murder and not an assault occasioning actual bodily harm. You're in, that, you're in the murder category. The prohibition of aggression and the need to take that seriously was a prerequisite for any sense of the rule of law. Now, it was not that there had never been any violations of the prohibition of aggression since 1945. But the point was, this was occurring after the magic decade. This was occurring after the end of the Cold War. This was occurring after a decade in which international law seemed to be beginning to be taken seriously as law. And I think one can argue that it may have had an impact on other states. I don't think you can prove it. I wonder whether Russia would have annexed Crimea and wandered into eastern Ukraine, but for that. Would China have rejected the finding of an arbitral tribunal with regard to artificial islands in the South China Seas? It's impossible to say what they would have done if those things had occurred in the late 1990s, but I think one can, at the very least, raise a question as to whether it's had a knock-on effect. The violation of the rules on the resort to force was followed by the US response to human rights concerns. It's not just that torture happened, because torture actually happens, arguably, in the majority of states globally. But the shock to the system was the US response. It tried to define torture out of existence. Waterboarding's just fine. It's what you do on a nice day out with the kids. They wanted to redefine it out of existence so they could claim it was not happening. The US brought in others to share their guilt. They put pressure on various states, including states bound by the European Convention on Human Rights, either to do their torturing for them or to allow the operation of US-run places, secret places of detention. Torture and enforced disappearances involve non-derogable human rights obligations and are amongst the most serious human rights violations that can occur. Now, this change in the legal climate, the change in the relative ease with which you can get agreements, the change in the status of international law was also found in other areas. I'm not suggesting this was all a product of um, the reaction to 9-11. I think there were other elements. But the Doha round of negotiations of the World Trade Organization, that was unsuccessful. When states tried to do for biological weapons what they'd done for chemical weapons just a decade earlier, that was unsuccessful. Now, to be fair, that's not just the result of changes in the legal climate. The, the nature of biological weapons means it's extremely difficult to come up with a practical way of implementing rules that you can rely on. So it, there were other elements, but it's striking that it was unsuccessful. So it looks as though since 2001, there has been a very significant change 
to the status of international law, to the seriousness with which international law is viewed. But it would be wrong to present a totally black picture. There is one agreement that has been concluded that is really innovative. And actually, most commentators were surprised that it was possible to reach consensus. I am, of course, speaking of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. It's innovative in a range of ways, but one of the most important is the idea of common but differentiated responsibilities. Now, that was first found in the Kyoto Agreement, but it's not the kind of thing you'd expect to see in a treaty. You assume you're all taking the same obligation to recognize that for a range of reasons, states need to have shared but different responsibilities is really a significant step. The Paris Agreement was a high point in effective multilateralism, and it occurred in this black decade. Since then, and lastly in this historical survey, there is the rhetoric of President Trump. It's too early to determine what he's actually going to do. In some areas, his actions to date, but of course this is only a couple of months, have been more cautious than the statements he made during the campaign. He's declared himself to be in favor of torture, even though his most senior military advisor says it doesn't work. He said he favors developing the coal industry and wants to abandon the Paris Agreement. He hasn't done it yet, but the people he's put in environmental positions in the US make one concerned. Rather than President Reagan's approach of speaking softly whilst carrying a big stick, President Trump seems to want to scream. What we don't know is whether he's threatening a big stick or not. So whilst we can't say what he's going to do, in nothing that he's said or done so far, has he shown any awareness of the existence or importance of international law, or even US constitutional law for that matter. He seems unused to the concept of law as a constraining element, as opposed to law as something to be got round. So what's going to be the effect of this on the strong European sense that had developed from 45 through to 2000, that international law was important? In fact, I think it's other developments that seem to be making inroads into this European consensus. The economic crisis, which started in 1998, has led to the cutting of budgets and austerity with all sorts of knock-on implications in Western European states. And that's focused a lot of attention on those making claims on welfare budgets. The refugee and migrant crisis has been handled with a near total disregard for the distinction between refugees and migrants and the non-respect of obligations owed to refugees. The rise of populist and nationalist politicians in Europe seems to pose a challenge to consensus-based, compromise-based multilateralism and to the respect of international legal obligations, however inconvenient they might be. The focus now is on national, not communal interests, on sovereignty, not consensus, on transactionalism, not consensus-based multilateralism. That suggests some form of change going on in the attitude to international law. So what's my conclusion? Is international law in crisis? I think the first point to note is that, to an extent, international lawyers may be reacting at the moment to the fact that there's been a check on what had been a long period of forward momentum. That immediately prior to the check, you'd had the best decade ever for international law. So there's a bigger contrast for them, and it may be in part that that's what they're reacting to, the amount of difference between the 1990s and the era after 2001, rather than simply the, what there is post-2001. The second point is, even if you're looking at the time since 2001, we must remember that there are still some positive elements. There are exceptions to generalizations that this were in a period of crisis. I think the Paris Agreement is one such exception. And we also need to remember that any check to the progress of international law has most definitely not taken us back to 1945. We are not back at square one. The institutions that have been created still exist. 
The norms are still there. So even if there's a reduced experience of respect of at least some of the norms, we can still say you're violating a norm, which you couldn't say until the norm was elaborated. So there's a danger that we're going to overreact when there are some gains that are still in existence. On the other hand, when the direction of travel has all been one way, you end up expecting to carry on in that direction. You don't expect to move backwards. There was no period between 45 and 2001. There'd been different speeds of progress, but at no point had one gone backwards. So it's not altogether a surprise that people react with shock. Another thing we need to consider is that the world in which we have this new approach to international law is a different world from the world in 1945. It's, a, to use the, um, almost a euphemism, it's a global village. We've got dramatic expansion in trade, dramatic expansion in transfers of capital, a transformation in the speed of communication. All those things make a multilateral, rule-respecting environment more and more necessary. It therefore makes the impact of any going back in the status of international law all the more serious. It might have mattered less in the world as it was in 1945. It's going to matter more in the world as it is now because we have a greater need for international law to play its proper role as law. So where does this leave us? If there's a shift from multilateralism to bilateralism, that's likely to be of long-term significance. If members of the Western group in UN terms, that's to say Western Europe, the US and Canada, regard international law as simply one of the things that need to be taken into account when deciding on national policy, as opposed to a decisive element, then that would be of long-term significance. Whilst there are tendencies among some of the nationalist populist movements in Europe in that direction, I don't think we're there yet. European states and Canada still seem to treat international law more seriously than that. There has been a change, and it's been a negative one, but it's too early to call it a crisis. There is a real danger that we will talk ourselves into the very thing that we want to avoid. But having said that, we can't afford to be Pollyanna-ish. We can't assume that everything is wonderful. What is necessary is that in this situation, we fight to maintain what we've got to prevent further slippage. So I don't think there is a crisis. I think there have been negative developments, and it's important to stop them going further back. But don't let's talk ourselves into a situation we wouldn't know how to deal with. Thank you. So everybody, there are two microphones. Um, I'm not sure if they're being handled. They are. Good. Just one. Gosh, you're going to be working hard, aren't you? <laughs> so questions to our speaker. Um, just behind you with the microphone. Hello. Uh, good evening. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Two uh, questions, quite rapidly. First, you, you mentioned about Iraq uh, as an act of aggression. Uh, I was surprised that your dual nationality doesn't recognize that one country tried to prevent it from happening, the same one that wasn't recognizing the international laws at a late stage. What happened then afterwards? So you recognize that it was an act of aggression. What are the consequences? That would be my first question. Second is, was Libya also an act of aggression? And the third question, sorry, <laughs> is uh, just to group them. I'm very glad you mentioned about international uh, law of the seas. Who is responsible for uh, governing it? And um, who is then acting, for example, if a state decides to build islands, as you mentioned earlier, into the international seas? Or if uh, a private venture decides to drill in the Arctic, for example, who is responsible then for enforcing these international laws? Or at least, you know, giving an agreement to go ahead with drilling, for instance. Thank you. Thank you. 
Do you want me to do each question as it comes? Yes, I think we're, if that's a button, okay. take this letter as a button right. off. Yes. Um, <clears throat> first of all, the consequences of the act of aggression. This is one of the areas where international law is not like domestic law, but it doesn't mean there aren't any consequences. Straight away, you thought, well, we can't trust the Americans and the Brits. In other words, it was seen as a dramatic departure from the expectation people would have had. I think it, then I was arguing that it meant that other states thought, well, I might otherwise have thought I couldn't do this because it's unlawful, but if they can get away with it, maybe I can. And one of the changes with the end of the Cold War was that the Security Council behaved a bit more responsibly. Generally speaking, if you've got a friend with a veto power in the Security Council, everything's hunky-dory. The problem for Saddam Hussein is he didn't have a, a P5 power in his pocket. The certain states have had the benefit of that since 1945. So it's not just the P5 themselves, it's their friends who get the benefit. Well, one had the sense between 1990 and 2000 that whilst if you really went against an ally of one of the P5, then you'd be in trouble, but that they were, there was discussion. For example, that happened over Kosovo. The reason I think that there was no attempt to get a Security Council resolution is that states have learnt what I learned aged about two, that it was better to ask for forgiveness than permission. They knew they couldn't ask a Security Council because Russia would say, look, I mean, we're supposed to be friends of the Serbs who are willing to turn a blind eye to it, but don't actually ask us to say it's lawful. Whereas what happened over Iraq was so flagrant that this was a complete shock to the system. So I think there have been consequences and we're still seeing them. And it's a, the consequences are the suspicion with which any, it's now assumed that when the UK and the United States claim, start, start using legal arguments that it's actually all political. Was Libya an act of aggression? No but there was a pause there, you've noticed. The intervening states got the authorization of the Security Council resolution. The problem was a different one. It was that the way in which they chose to interpret it, as it evolved over time, was more expansive than some of the states who voted for that authorization had envisaged. That is not the same as an act of aggression. But it has meant that since then, you can say goodbye to responsibility to protect in any resolution looking like that. Um, Russia and China will not, you know, they don't, they're not going to trust anybody with that kind of power. On the case, in the case of UNCLOS, UNCLOS is it's not sufficiently known, and that's really bizarre in a nation that used to have a maritime heritage. You'd have thought we'd know about Law of the Sea. It's got a full-time permanent tribunal sitting in Hamburg. Um, and actually, there's a Brit on it, so you'd have thought we might know it because of that. So, on, for many issues, the UNCLOS Tribunal can actually deal with matters. The ICJ is trusted with boundary disputes because that's one of the few things that states are willing to ask the ICJ about, and that includes maritime boundaries. But it was interesting that two recent disputes, for want of a better word, that involve maritime questions have gone to arbitration and not the UNCLOS tribunal. I have in mind there the um, reaction of the Mauritians to the declaration of a bad faith fishing zone around Diego Garcia, which was used as a pretext for keeping out the Chagos Islanders, and also China over the artificial islands. In the case of Mauritius, another reason why they had to find something peculiar that they could use was they couldn't go to the ICJ because the UK, we modified our 36-2 acceptance of ICJ to say, if you are a Commonwealth state, you are required to exhaust other remedies first. And that was put there because they feared that Mauritius might do something with regard to the Chagos Islands. Um, it's striking. I don't quite understand why China, if they agreed to the arbitration, should then simply reject it. Um, whether it's because the arbitration took quite a long period of time and so there's been a change in their attitude between them, whether they assumed they'd win, I don't think the Chinese are naive like that, so I'm a bit, I'm puzzled at that. But what's striking is the 
frequency with which states with maritime disputes will take them to some judicial or quasi-judicial form of dispute settlement. And most of that we, we don't read about in the press. So uh, thank you for raising the issue of UNCLOS. Thank you. Uh, questions? In the middle. <coughs> if the two of you could make short questions, I know you're beside each other. Oh, mine is a very short question. In view of, uh, what is it, 300,000 dead in Syria, and how many refugees? They're numbered in millions, I think. Um, I can't see how you can fudge the answer to the question posed by your title. Implementation of international law is in crisis. It didn't solve this ghastly problem. And I, I mentioned Ukraine as well. I mean, it's not quite as bad, but Syria is appalling. Pass. Surely a crisis. Pass the question to Puna. Uh, this is about Sri Lanka. <laughs> this is um, um, this is an intrastate conflict. Uh, this has been going on from the time of independence in 1948 till today. Uh, this UNHRC session, uh, there is uh, going to be a resolution on Sri Lanka. Um, that is by the UK, you know. Um, the oppressed people have no representation at the UN. For 70 years, uh, th uh, there is no voice for them. What can we do? What can the oppressed people do without a, a voice of the, uh, at the UN? Okay, thank you. Should we take those two? Yeah. Mine is a when, short when question. Looking, oh, sorry, the third one, yeah. Okay, mine is a short question. I just want to know how old is the world? How old is? The world. Which walls? The world, the world, W-O-R-L-D. How old is the world we live in? How old is the world? How old is the world? <laughs> I'd like to, I'll, I'll start with that last one in relation to international law, because I think for, you know, we only began to get international law in the 23rd hour, 59th minute. In that sense, international law is a bit like domestic law at, say, the time of Henry II. If you're looking at where the equivalent is, it's somewhere in the, it's definitely the medieval period, whether it's Henry II or a bit later, I don't know. So it's unreasonable to have expectations of international law that you'd have at the domestic level, at least in those states that have got an effective rule of law. Many states don't even have that at the domestic level. When you're looking at whether international law is in crisis, you can't simply say, is it ever violated? Because in that case, you'd say, let's scrap international law because it doesn't work, because there's always violations going on. In newspapers, you don't read of the number of people who haven't been murdered. You read of those where, who have been murdered, in other words, violations. There is no coverage of those areas of international law that routinely, day in, day out, are respected in a quiet kind of way. So I think the view we have of violations of international law is a distorted one. Having said that, and as an expert in the law of armed conflict, mm -hmm. I am particularly conscious of violations in the law of armed conflict. And in that regard, mankind, because this isn't so much states, it's individuals, has gone backwards since 1945. Let me give you a striking example that comes from a lecture I attended about 20 years ago in Bickel, British Institute of International Comparative Law, a British military medic showed a photograph on the screen. It was a road heading into the distance. On the left, there were some of those terribly erect continental trees, poplars, I imagine. And on the right, there was the edge of a building, a brick building. It was a photograph of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Arnhem. Control over that stretch of road changed three times in 10 days in 1944, and at no time was the activity of that hospital interfered with at all. The forces controlling it changed. It changed from German to British to German, but it functioned as a hospital treating patients irrespective of nationality. Now, in 2017, we see organized armed groups 
using hospitals, to, using the roof of hospitals to mount anti-aircraft guns, using facilities in hospitals to actually store weapons, and the states do this as well, and you get all parties targeting hospitals. That is a movement back not merely by states, but by people like you and me, the people who find themselves in a conflict area and don't say there's a bottom line. And it's something that particularly bothers the International Committee of the Red Cross. They're concerned about the, the, the whole wide issue of the diminishing respect for you know, intentional targets on civilians. You deliberately starve civilian population, even though that's a grave breach of the Geneva Conventions. The, in that area, the conduct of people in war is definitely going backwards and has been going backwards for at least 30 to 40 years, although it's speeded up quite a bit in the past 20 years. And it's not just states that are responsible. For a time, it was mainly non-state actors, but now they're joining in. So I don't think you can say that international law across the board is necessarily failing because it fails in some places. In particular, where you are dealing with a state that has a friend who's a P5 in the Security Council, that means the Security Council is incapable of dealing with the situation. And whilst Russia wasn't prepared to go to war over Kosovo, they've made it clear they are not going to accept any resolutions in the Security Council. So the, the most effective tool, the one with most clout, is disabled. It hasn't been helped by the European reaction, which is, I mean, the US was completely inept in how they handled the issue, but Europe wasn't any better for a very specific reason. We panicked about refugees. And for that reason, the only prism through which the conflict in Syria is seen is refugee flows. And that means, for example, because so many of them come via Turkey, that we then turn a blind eye to human rights developments in Turkey, because we want Turkey to keep hold of the Syrians. So I think when you're looking at is international law in crisis, you've got to look at something other than simply a list of violations. I think the kind of violations matter, but the, when you're talking about um, ongoing situations of conflict that are seen as involving really important state security issues, then if the Security Council can't act, it's going to be very difficult to deal with. But what matters more is, the, is looking at the attitude to law that's being manifested. And there, in the Syrian conflict, but it's not unique in this, we have seen a degree of violation of the rules on all sides, including the prohibition on the use of chemical weapons, which had been assumed until Saddam Hussein, it had been thought that that was a prohibition that worked. Um, so we have seen particularly serious violations there. In relation to Sri Lanka, I can imagine a different world, a world in which there were three UN bodies, something like the Security Council, a General Assembly for all states, and then an Assembly of Nations. But there is no way that we are going to be able significantly to change the UN machinery. The problem is Turkeys don't vote for Christmas. So the reason why we can't get change in the composition of the Security Council is because that has implications for the veto power and none of the existing veto powers, particularly the UK and France, um, want to open that question. So you're in a situation, I mean, the only time you change these omnicompetent intergovernmental organizations is after world war. And I would rather keep the UN than have a world war. But it means it's extremely difficult to get significant changes. And bearing in mind the changes in the world in which the UN is operating, I think it is institutionally not fit for purpose. So we've got to do the best we can with it. But personally, I think if there had been a forum for nations as well as states, I would have welcomed it. Okay, if some questions right at the back there, I'll take the couple, first you and then the gentleman behind you. 
Um, this is regarding uh, refugees. I've spent kind of like the last two years going to Calais and Dunkirk, and actually the only, the only, I mean, I've, I've witnessed them being tear gassed and shot out with rubber bullets, but. You know, the only, the only way I see this country is actually taking its responsibility for the refugee law introduced in 1946 is by actually Article 50 and there not being a border in France anymore. So, I mean, that I, I find just being in that situation says that it's not only in crisis, it's verging on non-existent, really, as far as um, our, our government seem to be, you know, um, using, using it to um, create legislation. Okay, really? and, the, and the gentleman in front of you. <clears throat> um, while mentioning the golden period of international law, you said that the non-European states accepted it because European states were subjecting themselves to the international law. But now with the populist rise in Europe and election of Donald Trump, you have complete disregard of international law. Uh, for example, during the campaign, Donald Trump went as far as to say that for terror to curb terrorism, you have to take their families out or uh, torture for that matter. And we see that uprising happening against the International Criminal Court where countries like Gambia, Burundi and South Africa are trying to remove themselves from the ICC. So don't you think this is indeed a step back in international law, whereas they are taking a cue from the European and Western states that they are not respecting international law? We'll take one more from... Okay, right down the front on the... <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, given what you've said regarding the, uh, the state of the world and the P5 in particular, where the veto power is being used for their own benefit rather than international justice, um, and also the fact that uh, a lot of countries are disregarding international law and going their own way, um, how, how close do you think the world is to a world war, given the fact that there's so many different conflicts going on that can very easily escalate? And the fact that the P5 is basically toothless, um, and it was created for that very specific purpose to prevent another world war. How likely do you think a world war is? Well, <laughs> not sure Ruth Stein Cross Code would have approved of that one. Um, first, the issue of refugees. Part of the problem there is that European states treated the Refugee Convention as part of the European acquis when they weren't having to deal with too many refugees because it was so difficult for people actually to reach Europe. And it means that when they are confronted with significant numbers, and I'm not including here migrant workers, I'm talking refugees, and also those who under EU law might be given exceptional leave to remain because they're fleeing a conflict zone. So I will include those, but I'm not talking about economic migrants. The UK, because it's an island, is in a position in which it can make itself inaccessible. And it has chosen to do so. That makes it extremely difficult to challenge legally what it's doing. If you've got people who make it to the UK and then they attempt to expel them, then it might be possible if you could get a very self-sacrificing law firm that was prepared to disregard things like legal fees, you might be able to challenge it under the Human Rights Act. But the problem is if they can't get here, in many cases, it's really difficult to find a way of challenging the British position. As a matter of fact, in relation to EU law, the assumption is that you are supposed to seek asylum in the first European state that you reach. So one wonders what on earth these people are doing in France, because they've come from somewhere else anyway. Um, they don't have a right recognized in law to say where they feel safe. The right that they have in international law is to seek, not necessarily to get, to seek asylum. And the state that is being asked to give them asylum is not allowed to send them to a place where their lives would be in danger, but not where they would feel unsafe, but where objectively their lives would be in danger. I think, I think you've made, made your yeah. point. Please listen to the answer. So I think in, in part, the, the problem is the UK is in 
even worse violation of the obligations to refugees than other states. But I would like here to put in a plug for a group that aren't sufficiently applauded, ordinary Greeks, who in a situation of extraordinary difficulty domestically, have opened their hearts and their homes to incredible numbers. They, um, they accept really significant risks to actually go out in heavy seas to bring them in. And I think more needs to be made of that. They, at an individual level rather than a state level, um, really should be getting a pat on the back by Europeans. So I, I, it is a huge problem area. I don't think on its own it's a sign that international law is useless. It's that international law is not being sufficiently used. And there are some cases that could be brought that aren't being brought in sufficient numbers. Those who've already got members of their families here, the, the families who are here should be bringing legal cases. On the issue of um, the question of whether, you know, how states have changed, third states have seen the change in Europe. I, th I think that in the, I mean, it, my experience was in the late 1990s, states like India, Mexico, you were able to negotiate with them. It didn't mean they agreed with you, but when you were raising a human rights argument, they actually listened. This was progress. They engaged. They assumed you were talking law and they would argue law with you, not simply assuming it was a political ploy. Now, with the changes that have happened, particularly the fact that it was those Western states that were violating particularly serious prohibitions, I think it has made a very big difference in that they now assume that actually, even if at the time Western states meant it, once push comes to shove, once the chips are down, then like everybody else, they're going to treat it like politics. So it's gone back a step to seeing all these legal arguments as politics in another guise. But there is one bit of possible good news the reaction of China to the rubbish that Trump was spouting on the Paris Agreement was, in that case, we'll take the lead. Because people had thought that there was a real risk the whole agreement would collapse if the US pulled out. China, because for internal domestic reasons, not least their dramatic pollution problem, they want to address some of the issues that are relevant to climate change. And if they do take it upon themselves to take the lead, then that is going to make at least some of Trump's advisors, if not Trump himself, think. So we've got to wait and see whether other states are willing to pick up certain batons. It won't be across the board. It won't be China suddenly saying international law is the greatest thing since sliced bread. But in certain areas, you may get some initiatives like that. Are we heading towards um, a new world war? I think the first thing we've got to be very cautious about is the element I raised at the end. We've got to be really careful we don't talk ourselves into the, precisely the thing that we are objecting to. There are a range of concerns, and they include the fact that in some areas we don't have the tools of international law that we need to address the problem. Um, NATO keeps talking about something that I think is a political science term, but I wish they wouldn't use it in the presence of lawyers. They speak about hybrid warfare to cover a situation that is by definition not war. Well, I do have a bit of a difficulty with that as a lawyer. They're talking about the situation where one state exploits the situation in an adjacent, usually smaller state. They may exploit alleged or actual grievances of a minority population that share their ethnicity, they hollow out that state so that they can bring about a situation in which then perhaps they're going to support their compatriots or they might not even need to go to war. Now, there the problem is that in relation to the prohibition on the use or threat of force, what's in, what they're engaging in isn't actually at this stage force. We don't have the tools in international law, but this is a much earlier stage than war. So stop calling it hybrid war. I think we do need to look at the tools available that enable us to identify activities by states which are not merely unfriendly, but which have 
carry with them an eventual risk of something very much worse. But one of the difficulties in that area is something that's going to happen more and more often in international law, is the problem of attribution, knowing who's doing it. Because just because someone is in the territory of State A doesn't mean that State A is implicated. Now, that's clearly true with anything involving cyber, but I think it, more widely it's going to be regarded, it's going to become a problem if you've got organized armed groups, knowing in what circumstances they're actually under the control of a state and when they're not is going to affect what you can do about them. So I think we haven't adapted the tools of international law sufficiently to the changed world in which they're operating, particularly with regard to communications, but not just communications. I would hope, I mean, generally speaking, it seems to me that the history of Russian and Soviet leadership is they're not idiots. I wouldn't have had that confidence in Gaddafi and I don't have that confidence in North Korea. But whilst you may end up with a mess that could have been prevented, I don't think they are seeking it. I think the West could not have handled worse the security implications since 1990 of the end of the Warsaw Pact. You needed to overhaul the role of NATO. It needed to become a security organization of pan-European reach. In other words, it needed to be able to absorb within it Russia, and that would have meant a change in the nature of its activities. Russia has always felt threatened, and it is not alone in this, if uh, adjacent states are not under its control. If you'd suffered invasion as often as Russia had suffered invasion, it's where the Brits need a bit of humility about those countries that have been invaded. It does make, and, and been occupied. It makes a difference to how they see the world. Leaving aside issues of zones of influence, I think it was, we could possibly have got away with admitting Poland and possibly for historic reasons the Baltic states, but some of the expansion of NATO has been really in your face as far as the Russians are concerned. So it's not a surprise that they are reacting in the way in which they're reacting. And we're going to have to be careful because they are running the risk of very significant economic crises because of the decline in the price of oil. And Everybody knows that if you've got a significant crisis at home, the best thing is a nice little bit of foreign war. Um, so one's got to be careful, but I don't think the Russians are the key problem. I think North Korea looks as if it's even less under control than it used to be, unless China pulls its finger out. I think China is in a position to prevent that going um, all the way, but I would not like to be living in South Korea or even Japan at the moment. Right. So, before the war, we must make sure we have a drink. <laughs> Even during the war. <laughs> but, but before then, I'm asking Amanda Pinto, Chairman of the International Committee of the Bar Council, to give the vote of thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, it's a huge honour for us, for the Bar Council of England and Wales, to be associated with this event, which we are thrilled to be involved with and have been for many years and to support the uh, UNA Westminster. As you may know, the Bar Council's International Committee has a number of different functions. One of them is to promote the Bar and English law. I'm slightly more worried about that latter thing after this evening, but uh, secondly, to work with lawyers and law associations internationally to join together what's important, and, and thirdly, to promote and support the rule of law internationally. Uh, and this sort of event is such a great um, opportunity for us to engage in uh, those things. Well, this evening, uh, Professor Hampson has given us war, crimes against humanity, human rights abuses, torture, chemical weapons, climate change, the law of the sea, uh, a positive for Donald Trump because he's not as bad as uh, yet, yet as uh, South Korea, uh, and indeed Henry II, all in 70 years. <laughs> I, it is such an impressive feat. Uh, what I have found so interesting um, and want to thank you for is the 
knock-on effect of violations by which the actions of one state uh, enables or changes the paradigm in which other states uh, then act. And you've been looking at it rather sadly, mainly negatively, but I'm hopeful that, that there's also a positive cycle that, we've, that you've identified in the past and that may hopefully be uh, available again in the future. Um, it's sobering to note that our own country acts so poorly at the moment in, in international law terms. But what a fascinating evening. Dan, thank you so much for hosting it. David, thank you so much for your enthusiasm and support. And Professor Hampson, thank you for your talk and your generosity in answering what was, frankly, the most fascinating global range of questions <laughs> I think I've ever heard. Thank you very much.